It's in Jesus' name we all say, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Good morning, everyone. It is summer, and uh, give, uh, give a hand to Willie for getting our youth ministry together and a bunch of things happening. It's summer. It's almost, uh, man, it's awesome. I got back from Florida last night. So uh, we had a, a convention called Foursquare Convention. We belong to the denomination called Foursquare. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about it in the message. But I got back last night about 10, 10, honey, about 10, 10.30. And then um, here I am this morning. I am on still East Coast time. And so if you hear my stomach rumble, it's because of my afternoon snack that I'm getting hungry for. It's not breakfast or anything like that. I had an awesome time in Florida. Uh, not that I saw very much. Uh, I'm also on the board of directors, and so a couple of issues that we had a lot of different meetings on. So as we're catching the, the Uber to the airport, I look at my wife and I go, so this is what Orlando looks like. You know, I had no idea what Orlando looks like outside of the hotel, so, but we're back and uh, a lot of good stuff. Next year is the 100th anniversary of your denomination, Foursquare. So the founder, Amy Semple McPherson, founded the church, the denomination, January 1st, 1923. So next year is the 100th anniversary. It'd be kind of cool if we go, it's, called, it's in Anaheim, California. So guess how many people are going to be at the convention, right? You know, so it'd be nice to kind of get a group together. We go there. Anybody in for footsteps of Mickey, we can do something like that as a, as a trip to go over there. But yeah, so good stuff happening. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But this morning, I want to ask you this question. How many of you want to live a good life? Anybody? Some of the guys that came to the steak dinner are going, hmm, I heard this question before. How many of you want to be a good wife? Good wife? Good wife? Hey, okay. how many of you want to be a good husband? Good husband? Now, how many of you want to be a good, good Christian? Good Christian? Okay. All oh, wrong answers. Wrong answers. Wrong answers. Yeah, don't settle for good. You want to be great. You want to be a great husband. You want to be a great employee. You want to be a great boss. You want to be a great Christian. Because Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, the devil has come, the enemy has come, to steal, kill, and to destroy. But I have come, says the Lord, that you might have life and that you might live it to the fullest, the greatness. Don't set up for just being good. You want to be a great Christian. You want to be a great, oh, you're such a good husband. No, 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 I'm a great husband, honey. I'm a great husband. You're such a great man. No, no, I'm, a, I'm a, gr a good man. I'm a great man. But what keeps us from living the great life? A lot of different things, but I think for today I want to talk about worry, stress, and anxieties. It really holds us back from the greatness that God has for our lives. He wants us to live the great life. But we hold ourselves back because of stress, worry, and anxieties. And when you think about it, before the pandemic, you know, hit, the world was already full of stress and worries. The pandemic, as it did with everything else, accelerated what was already in motion. And I think the most underreported statistic of all that we experienced in these last two years is the amount of deaths caused by stress, anxiety, and worries. You don't die from stress. You die from the complications that stress imposes on your life. Heart disease, things with your circulatory system, things that happen within your nervous system, high blood pressure. All of these things are contributed to and, and lead up to because of, of this thing called stress, worry, and anxiety, which, which medical professionals and those in a psychological in, uh, profession, they say is the silent assassin. Stress, worry, anxieties are out to get you. And many times we, we, not knowing how to deal with it, we allow it to happen. And a person dies and we go, oh, what happened? Oh, he died because of a heart attack. No, because stress was on his life. There was so much going on in their lives. I think stressed people are the ones that settle for a life that's just good enough. Because we're just trying to survive. And if you're just trying to survive, you're not going to thrive in the life that God has for you. Listen to what this one guy says. Jim Collins, writing about business and companies, book called Good to Great. He says, good is the enemy of great. 
And that is one of the key reasons why we have so little that become great. Few people attain great lives, in large part because it's just so easy to set off with a good life. What causes the stress and anxiety and worries in our lives? I think it's this, it's unmet expectations. We all set ourselves up for these expectations, the things that we want to achieve, the things that we where we want to go, and when we don't get there, it, it, it just caves in on us. And it's like the whole world is, 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 uh, is putting us down. Um, how many graduates in the house today? High school, college, how many students? How many under uh, 25 years old? Under 25 years old? Yeah, all you guys are going, don't call on me. I don't want to go up on stage. Here's a, here's a quick life lesson. And those of you who are over 30 years old, agree with, if you agree with me, say amen to this, all right? For the lesson for the young ones is this. You're not going to always get what you want. Amen? amen. You're not going to always get what you want. And you're going to learn that even as you get older, you're going to plan out these, these logical progressions called life. You have your five-year goal, your 10-year goal, and you think, okay, get a good education. Parents told you that? Get a good education. Why? So you can get a good job. Why? So you can get good benefits. Why? So you can have a good life, right? We have these logical progressions. And sometimes we have these expectations according to these progressions and then when something happens in the middle, when there's a hiccup along the way, or when it caves in and it doesn't turn out the way we wanted it to, we don't know how to handle that, and we stress, and we worry, and we get anxious, and it causes us to miss the life that God has for us. See, not all logical progressions will end up the way that you want it to. It's like this lady who was asking this man, she goes, well, how, do you, how old do you think I am? And the man goes, well, from your eyes, uh, your eyes, let's see, 25, from your hair, maybe um, 22, uh, from your body, maybe 18. And the lady goes, whoa, you really know how to impress a woman. He goes, no, 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 I'm trying to add up the numbers. Just hold on to this. Yeah? <laughs> you know, we have these expectations. We make these assumptions that if we lay these things out, it should give us what we want. It's not always like that. Not always like that. And when we hit this hiccup in the road and we don't know what to do with it, it's like you dedicate yourself to this company you've been working for so long. I mean, you gave your life to this company and you expect this retirement that's going to come soon and you unexpectedly get laid off. Or you've been trying to be healthy, you've been trying to run and exercise, you've been trying to eat all the right foods. And a doctor gives you a diagnosis that you never saw coming. Or you're raising your child in the way that he or she should walk, and when they get older, they, want, they will not depart from it. But one day, your child comes into your house, and she says, I'm leaving the faith. This, this whole church thing is for the birds. You know, how do you handle that? How do you respond? Because therein lies the tension. How do you pursue the great life when you find yourselves immersed way over your head and God's not around? That you pray and you want God to be there and you pray and you want God to answer your prayer, but it seems like everything is silent. What happens when what you believe collides with what is called unbelief or the doubts that go on in your mind? Because that's when your faith is tested. Go to Mark chapter 9. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. Our ushers will gladly give you one. If you don't own one, take it home with you. Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9 uh, describes, and let me give you the context here. Jesus going up to the mount, and they call it the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus takes with him Peter, James, and John, his inner circle, which meant nine other disciples were left at the bottom of the hill. So Jesus goes up to the mountain. He is transformed, transfigured, this bright whiteness. And the voice of the Lord comes out that says, this is my beloved son. This is my son in whom I love. Listen to him. And they're like, whoa, this is powerful. What a great moment. We've never heard anything like this before. And now they got to come down the mountain. 
In other words, after this, this transformational moment in their life where they see Jesus transfigured before the Lord God and they hear God's voice, they now got to come back to reality. It's like being in church on Sunday. This is so good. Oh, worship is so good. What a food. We're going to get better food, by the way, in the cafe. Everything is so good. And then Monday. Anybody ever had that feeling? Everything is so good over the weekend. And then you hit Monday. Came back from this uh, four-square denomination uh, convention. Flew all the way to Florida. And flying all the way to Florida, although I'm on the board of directors, I don't really know what's on the program, except for maybe one or two speakers that's going to be on the program. Um, they captured it already in, a, uh, in a, a summary video. I want you to see what they put together. And you might recognize somebody in this video. Take a look at this. The greatest days of spiritual outpouring are ahead of us, and I'll tell you why I believe that. There's a God who is still moving. Pretty cool, yeah? Hawaii represented in Florida. The 808 state was there. I mean, you saw somebody familiar in that? Yeah? Yeah, Tiffany Thurston, right? Uh, you saw uh, Fernando, Pastor Fernando, yeah? I mean, Hawaii represented. Well, there was Brandon there too, but you know, but uh, oh, that boy brought it, man. You know, I'm sitting in the audience and he's going, he's, he's, he's giving it all, he's going at it. And I'm thinking, you know how Jesus, they're up there in the mountain and they said, this is my son in whom I love. Listen to him. I want to stand up and go, hey, that's my son. That's my son. Yeah, listen to him. I mean, it was, it, was so, it was so rich. The whole atmosphere was rich. You know, I was, uh, yeah, not for about him. Show, show, show me on that. Okay, yeah, so, so I was, you know, on the board and there's a, um, a process to revamp the whole presidential selection of, uh, for the Foursquare denomination. And so I'm on that committee. So we did a presentation. So. I got to share the stage too, but you know, first time I guess father and son were on the same stage. It was such a rich time. And then I got to come back to reality. I mean, this is good. You guys are good, all right? There's, there's nothing wrong with this. Nothing wrong with this at all. But you know, I was, um, you know, part of the, the board, so we're in all of the worship and all that stuff. There's also business going on. And one of the big issues was abuse in leadership. Not so much in the sexual manner, but if you follow some of the news, there's been some pretty major things going on with pastors um, just doing whatever they want to do. It's like they're God's anointed. You know how they, they say, you never touch God's anointed. Just let them do whatever they want to do. It's been a problem, and we want to be able to address that at the, at the outset, not wait for the damage to happen before we do something. So we were in a lot of meetings. That's why people say, well, how is Orlando? I don't know. <laughs> you know, I have no idea. But, you know, coming off of all of that, then to get, get ready for, you know, the weekend, and I thought we'd give ourselves a little bit of breathing room as we're coming back from, uh, from Florida because we had this big transforming kind of a convention. Uh, several things happened in the next two days. So we ended on Thursday, and uh, just, just full transparency, right? Full transparency. So I figured, okay, I'm going to rest up 
Friday, Saturday, come home Sunday. Diane Fong was supposed to give the message this weekend. But she was exposed to someone with COVID. And so she, and then she started feeling sick. And then Brandon's in Portland with Kara's family, you know, so they're taking time up there. And so who got to prepare a message on, on Thursday afternoon while everybody going alligator farm and all that stuff, you know. And then to get on a plane to travel back and, and you know, you hear my voice. It's not always the sexy women, okay, so. <laughs> I wake up and my throat feels a little scratchy. And I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, I got to get this thing done. And not COVID, I tested, no COVID. Just a little, I guess, cold or whatever. You try traveling on the airplane with this kind of stuff. Miserable. It's like after this mountaintop experience, welcome to reality. And, and, it's, uh, and then last night, you know, I could, I could hardly sleep because I'm still on East Coast time. I'm waking up in the middle of the night. I have this, it's a dry kind of cough. It's just an itchy throat, you cough but it doesn't allow you to sleep well. So I'm getting up and I'm thinking, I'm thinking I'm calling a media guy. Is there another way that I can deliver a message so I don't have to be here this morning, you know? So all of these things, so I didn't get a good night's sleep and yet I gotta do this stuff. No, I gotta do it. Lord, I, I, I'll do it for you, Lord, I'll do it for you. But you're in that mode where it was a beautiful, spiritual, mountaintop experience and now reality. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You hit reality. It's not always the transfigured moments where your faith is tested. It's those times when you hit reality. It's where you, you, you figure to yourself, okay, Lord, I've been doing this stuff. It should all be good, right? And then it collides. And your world collides. And that's what happened here in this story. Maybe because I chose this scripture to read from that that's happening to me right now. But Jesus comes down from the mountaintop and he meets the other nine disciples. He's stepping into Monday morning. Okay, Mark chapter 9, verse 14. When they came to the other disciples, so Jesus and the three, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them, the other disciples. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are, you, what are you arguing with them about, he asked. Who was he talking to? And who's them? What are you arguing with them about? So you had the Pharisees, you had the disciples, you had people around. We'll talk a little bit, go into what they're probably arguing about. But all this murmuring going on. And Jesus says, well, what are you talking and arguing with them about? I think he was talking to the disciples. What are you arguing with these guys? What are you arguing about? He's looking at the nine disciples that were there at the mountain, the foot of the mountain, while he and the three others were being transfigured on the mountaintop. And now in reality, things weren't the same as on the, up on the mountain. So why are you arguing with these guys? See, what the story talks about is a man who had a son, and some people say he was probably suffering from epilepsy. He'd go into these seizures. He'd foam at the mouth. His, his teeth and his jaw would be clenched and gripped. And this man, and, and I cannot imagine how long this man had to put up with this with his son. My heart goes out to anyone who raises a child with disabilities. I, I, I don't know how. If that's you, I don't know how you do it. My heart goes out to you. But this man, hearing that Jesus was in the area, brings his son to Jesus. He's desperate. He wants a miracle. He says, this has been going on for so long. And I heard that this Jesus guy, he, he performs miracles. He heals. I can imagine this, this desperate, frustrated father bringing his son to the disciples where Jesus was supposed to be, but not finding Jesus. It's like you're struggling through something this whole week, and I got to get to church, and you come this morning, and Brandon not here. 
You're listening. Brandon's not here. <laughs> Corinne Tokunaga, she's not here. Diane Funk, she's not here. Ed Kinney, he's not here. Should I go on? <laughs> you come and, and you look and you go, oh, only got Cameron and Willie. Yeah, they're good. They have the empowerment. They're authorized. But Jesus wasn't there. Can you imagine how he felt? Can you imagine how the frustration and his expectations, everything that he hoped would have happened that day because Jesus, the miracle worker, would have been there, is not there? How everything dropped? My marriage is about to die, and I've been struggling with this for so long, and I want Jesus to be there, and he wasn't there. I've been struggling with this health issue for so long, and I want a miracle. And I come and I, and I ask, and Jesus isn't around. The frustration of this father. Jesus looks at them and he says, who, 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 what, what are you arguing about? I think what they're arguing about is that these Pharisees or teachers of the law they're always looking for a way at, at tearing apart the ministry of Jesus because he was a threat to them. They were the leaders of the law. They knew what the law meant. They knew what God said, according to them. And if they can tear apart this thing called the ministry of Jesus and the disciples, more power to them. So I think it's not written there, but I, I try to jump in the pages to just kind of listen what's going on. I can imagine the teachers of the law saying, so what, disciples? You guys prayed? You're supposed to have the power to do this? And it never happened. What's up with that? Where's your Jesus? Where's your Jesus when you really needed him? In fact, they asked a question that is still being asked today by people out there, maybe in your office, maybe in your neighborhood. Why do bad things happen to good people? So where is it? Your life isn't getting any better. And I can see the disciples becoming very, very confrontative and defensive. And that's where the argument started to happen. And Jesus says, what are you arguing with them? Why are you arguing with them? So he says, what are you arguing with them about? Now here's something interesting that happens next. Notice who answers Jesus. It wasn't the disciples who says, well, this is what we're saying because I think they're too ashamed to answer Jesus. What are you arguing with them about? Notice the Pharisees weren't the ones that said, hey, 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 Jesus, let me tell you what. Mm, they didn't say anything because they got shamed by Jesus many times before, right? Who answered Jesus' question? What are you arguing with them about? It was a father. A father. And I sense the depth and the degree of his frustration. That's why he had to say something. He couldn't hold it any longer. And the father says in verse 18, I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. That's frustration. That's unmet expectations. And the father's going through this. He doesn't want to just, just take his son back home again and just be okay and live the good life. There's something greater waiting for him. He could sense, you could sense the frustration of the father where he's beginning to doubt himself. I asked the disciples to help me, but, but they couldn't. In other words, why am I such a failure as a man? I can't even provide for my family. I can't even provide for my wife. How come I can't even help my son? My son is helpless. And I come to the church, and even the church can't help. Because nobody wants to say that, that they can step forward and do what, what God wants, me to, uh, wants to happen in my life. And so Jesus gets very upset. You can hear the indignation in his voice. Mark 9, go to verse 19. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. And so they brought him. 
when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. Now, that's an interesting point there because you notice that the spirit, when he saw Jesus, didn't shrink away. Didn't go, oh, you're the Lord of lords, so I'm going to jump into these pigs and jump off the cliff. Wasn't like that at all. This spirit was a bad dude. This spirit was not afraid of Jesus. This spirit was a spirit that was way over the heads of the disciples, way over anything they've, they've experienced in the past. In other words, the disciples probably felt as frustrated and helpless as that father did. He fell to the ground and rolled around foaming at the mouth. Verse 21, Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It's often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you don't have that underlined in your Bible, underline that right now. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. Because here is the heart, I think, of the teaching that Jesus wants us to learn. Because these, Jesus then says, if you can, Everything is possible for the one who believes. Now, I got to put a pause on that. Again, because I get into the scripture, I kind of want to stand there and imagine really what was happening. This is just me. It's not in any theological study. But I go back and I wonder, how did Jesus ask that question? If you can? Because Jesus can ask that question in several ways, right? If you can, or you can say, if you can, or you can say, if you can, how, how, what do you think the inflection was on Jesus' voice? I think it was one where he said, if you can, anything's possible to those who believe. And the father comes back, and the father says, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Okay, let's try that again. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, why would Jesus ask such a question with an obvious answer? I mean, that's like saying, is the Pope Catholic? I mean, some people beg to differ on that. Oh, oh do, do Pakis tip well? There's an obvious answer to that. I don't have to say. Do, do Portuguese stop talking? I, 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 I mean, is, your, is your pastor handsome? I mean, the, the answer is just so obvious. Why ask the question? Because I don't think Jesus was asking him whether, 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 whether he could. Because Jesus says, I can. It's obvious. I can. Here's, I think, what Jesus was saying. Jesus says, of course I can. Not a question of whether I can. Here's a question. What do you believe that I can? Not whether I can. I can. I can do anything. Right? Amen? Nothing is impossible with God. Lord, can, can, you, can you fix my marriage? Can I? If I can? Absolutely. Can you heal me? Absolutely. It's not a matter of whether I can. What do you believe that I can? Big difference. Big difference. What do you believe, Jesus says, that I can do? Because I see our, a, a sense of our frustrations when we have unmet expectations, things that drive us to worry and anxiety is when we have this doubt of whether he can do it or not. Because we believe he can, but we don't know. Is that collision between your belief and your unbelief. And if you don't know how to navigate through that, we go through this stress and we say, ah, I think I'll just settle. It's too much work. Why do you think Mark recorded this story here? You notice they don't have a name on that, with that who that man is. He's never identified. You know why? Because he's us. This is us. We, we, we say, yeah, Jesus, you can, 
But I don't know. Can you really? You, 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 can, you can heal me, but, but can you really? I, I need to make it through one more service at 11 o'clock. Jesus, I believe you can make, get me, but can you really? <laughs> so make sure you record this because we're going to play this back for the 11 o'clock service. In fact, that happened once, you know. I was at Farrington, big, big crowd, and I was scheduled to preach. Pastor Wayne, who I was uh, executive pastor, or he was on the mainland. There's no way he's going to come back. On a Wednesday, my voice is gone. Absolutely gone. Not even a whisper. And I'm going, what the heck? So I go to an ENT. I nose, throat, right? I ear, nose, throat. They scope everything. Stick this scope up my nose. You can see the light flashing through my eye. Everything. No, you're clear, Pastor. I cannot talk. How am I, how am I going to speak? Well, we can give you this injection. Put on your pants. Give me this injection. Thursday. This is Wednesday. Thursday. Writing notes to my wife. What's for dinner? <laughs> can you make some tea for me? No more voice. Well, come back Friday. We'll see how you're doing. They had services on Saturday night and Sunday morning. There were five services. So I, I go back Friday, no more voice. He said, well, what are you going to do? I said, there's nobody there to speak. You know, Pastor Owen cannot be Pastor Owen and take over for him and substitute for himself. If no more me, no more. And so I got to get ready and everything, and then I believe that you can. I don't know, because no more voice. I believe that you can. So I go there on Saturday at 5 o'clock service, and I talk to the, the, the media guys. Make sure you get a good recording of this, because I don't know how long this is going to last. And so at 5 o'clock, I preached. Came out. Good. How are you? Good for 7 o'clock? Yeah, let's give one more shot. Got up. I preach. Voice came out. Go home Saturday night. I'm a voice. Come Sunday morning. I mean, if you think this is low, and was, I mean, it was low. Preach Sunday morning. Preach 7 o'clock. Preach 9 o'clock. Okay, 11 o'clock. Let's give him a shot. Preach 11 o'clock. The doctor even came to service because she didn't believe that I would be able to preach. And she goes, wow, I can't believe you made it through. I believe... I had some unbelief, let me be honest with you. There are times where you, you, you believe, but is that good enough? This father was going through a tough time. See, what happens is, see, we all have that sense of unbelief. True? Am I the only one? Am I speaking to myself? Everybody has this sense of unbelief. We believe, but we always have this sense of unbelief in us. And the, the, the challenge for us is, what do we do with that? Sometimes we don't want to admit that we have a sense of unbelief. Because we might be looked upon as, oh, you're not that strong of a Christian. But we don't, know what, we don't know what to do with that. And then we look at people like, we go, oh, well, we can't be like Paul, the apostle Paul. I don't have that kind of faith. I don't have that kind of faith like Abraham to just do whatever. I don't have that kind of faith like, like, like Frida. I mean, she can do everything. And if we cannot get to that level, we, we settle. And we just go for good enough. But I, I don't know if you agree with me on this or not. But you know my life, I'll be truthful with you. There are times that I believe. There are times I have doubts over the same thing. The times that I believe that he can, the times that I say I'm not sure, the times that I say I have faith, but the times that I'm still, still afraid. Are you willing to believe even when you feel that you failed like this father? Even though you're hearing there's voices of skeptics and doubters around you, are you still willing to believe and be open and honest about your unbelief? 
Because where that intersection of your belief and your unbelief collide, it becomes a very dangerous intersection. It allows too many on-ramps for questions that you have about God, about God's Word, about what a good counsel, wise counsel is being given to you. It becomes a very dangerous intersection because there are too many options that are waiting for you. 2019, a study was done about all the, the, the roadways and intersections across the United States of America in 2019. Guess which is the, 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 the most dangerous roadway in America, according to this study? Guess where? Guess where? In Hawaii. Guess where? Guess where? Any street around Ala Moana Center. Yeah, it made a national report. Why? Because they said Ala Moana Center has so many entrances and exits that people are coming in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. There's so many options for an accident to happen. We have the most dangerous street in America circling the Alamana Mall. And you women love to go there to that mall. But it's like our faith, you know, when that, that belief and unbelief collide and we don't know what to do with it, it opens ourselves up to too many options about God and what does he say. But, but that intersection of belief with unbelief can also become a point of divine intervention. It can be a dangerous intersection. It could also be a very marked point of divine intervention. James 1, consider it all joy when you, cons when you face trials of many kinds. Why? Because trials are there for the testing of your faith. Anything that's not tested will never get stronger. The times that you come to a point where you believe, but I don't know if I believe. You believe, but there's unbelief. It's a point that God may be testing. Testing the strength of your faith. Is it really possible to believe and have unbelief at the same time? Is it possible to have faith and still have doubts at the same time? Absolutely. Absolutely. Things that we believe in, are the things that we, th we heard that God can do or we, we assume that God can do. We believe in that. Go back to uh, Matthew 11 if you can. Matthew 11. Matthew 11 is, captures the moment where John the Baptist, the cousin of Jesus, he was anointed, he was appointed, he was given everything that Jesus <coughs> sorry, needed to have done to prepare the way for the Lord. And he does everything according to what God asked him to do, including calling out the marriage of Herod and to, to his sister-in-law. And because of that, John the Baptist, although he's the man God appointed to prepare the way of the Lord, ends up in prison. Can you imagine what's going through his mind at that time? God, I did everything for you. And yet here I am in prison. In other words, it's one of those moments in the Bible where What's wrong with this picture, God? I did everything according to your ways. I felt that. I shared about that with you when I was diagnosed with leukemia. I was doing everything for you, God. And you get diagnosed with leukemia. What's wrong with this picture, God? Matthew 11, verse 2. When John, who was in prison, <coughs> heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? You hear doubt in his voice? Are you the Messiah? Or should we expect someone else? I've been trying my best, God. If you ever felt that way, and you're in a situation where you don't see it logically progressing the way that you planned it, you're not alone. John the Baptist was in that exact situation. But look at how Jesus answered him. Matthew 11 and verse 4. Jesus replied to his disciples, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Blessed is anyone, the way I would interpret that, 
those who are looking to live the great life and not just settle for good are those who won't stumble on economy. Well, what's he saying there? He's saying, those who allow me to do the things that I need to do, said Jesus, and not the things that you're expecting me to do, are the ones that's going to understand the greatness of, God, of God's life, of God's journey for you. Because, see, our unexpe unmet expectations many times happen because we're focused on the wrong thing. John was focused on where he was, his prison, his situation. He was not thinking what Jesus was pursuing, which was healing the sick, allowing the lame to walk, the bigger picture of what was happening. We get frustrated when all we focus on are the things that we see and we expect God to join us. Henry Blackaby said, no, that's not right. You look where God is moving and that's where you go. You join him in what he's doing. So rather than looking at our own circumstances, don't allow your present to define God's presence. Our present circumstances doesn't define where God is present. When we focus on the wrong thing, we get frustrated and we end up going down the wrong road. I've shared the story about being uh, stuck out in Kaneohe Bay. For some of you that have heard this story for the last 10 times, forgive me, but uh, those of you that are new, when you were kids, we used to go out to Kanuhei Bay. You know, kids, you do everything crazy. And this friend of mine said, put up a lean-to. Just get a canvas sheet with two sticks, and we'll prop it up on a sandbar out in Kanuhei Bay. And then we'll lay some nets out in the bay. I said, are you crazy? We're going to drown if we get out there. He goes, no, no, no. Different seasons. Who, who lives in Kanuhei? You guys know this, huh? Different times of the year. The, the, the bay, the, the sandbar really pops up. And uh, so, so we did that. We laid out lean-to, we went out, laid out nets. So we go out at night to check the nets. And as we're checking the nets, uh, I can hear the surf. And I said to my friend, we're too far out, let's go back already. So there's a, a lantern we left on, this, on a sandbar. So as we're walking back, um, so we had some fish in a bag, and I'm carrying a lantern. And my friend had the spear. And uh, I discovered that night that white eels love light. Yeah? Who's carrying the lantern? And I'm carrying the fish. And these white eels, okay, I was a judge, so this is a true story, right? The eels must have been about this fat around. They're huge. We're, out, we're way out. And like maybe six feet long. So I'm holding the lantern, and these eels are coming. They're going between my legs. And I'm kind of like, whoa, what are you doing? I'm stomping, thrashing in the water. And I said to my friend, like, we got to get back. So the light that we saw was a sandbar, so we started walking in that direction. But every time we started heading toward that light, the water got deeper. Got up to my belly button. So we turn a different way. We go this way. The water came up to my chest. Turn this way. Go this way. Come up to my chest. Now, now we're holding. I'm holding the bag and the lantern above the water. White eels are in the water. And a <clears throat> friend of mine... Um, you guys know Aaron Mahi? Anybody know Aaron Mahi? Music, Hawaiian guy? Yeah, we were out there in Kanoe Bay. And both two Hawaiian guys in the bay yelling at the middle of, our, uh, middle of midnight with just completely dark skies. Will, the name of our friend who had a boat. So we're going, Will, Will. We're, we're in the middle of Kanoe Bay screaming the name of Will. And this putt putt comes on this boat. And Will goes, Where are you guys going? I said, we're going to the sandbar, the light over there. We left the lantern. He goes, that's not the sandbar. There's hay up here. The sandbar is that direction. You guys going after the wrong light the whole time. <laughs> and I'm thinking, you know, that's what we do, don't we? We get frustrated because we think we're doing everything we can to get to that light when that's the wrong light. That's not the light God has for you. And we get stressed because we're not getting there. And we're going to die. It's the wrong light. <coughs> and it's almost like Jesus said to the, to the disciples who tell John the Baptist, don't focus on the things that you want to look at. Look at what I'm doing. Look at what I'm doing, says Jesus. I've given you this prayer before. I would highly encourage you to apply it to your life. Lord, give me eyes to see what you're seeing. Give me eyes to see what you're seeing. Ears to hear 
what you're saying. Because there's so many voices around here. There are all these doubters and skeptics around saying, so what's up with your God, man? So if you believe in that, then how come your life isn't the best? You got all these voices. God, give me eyes to see what you're seeing. Give me ears to hear what you want me to hear. And give me a heart that's willing to obey, to do what you're asking me to. You know, you, you young ones, if you can take that to heart and take that home with you, that would help you tremendously as you're getting older. Because you get older. You will get old, okay? You can get old like your dad. You will get old. And all along the way will be all these voices, all these Pharisees and teachers of the law trying to set you on the wrong road. Give me eyes to see what you're seeing. Give me ears to hear what you want me to hear. And give me a heart of obedience. So then you align your expectations by trusting that he is who he says he is. Our expectations aren't based on what we want. It's based on who he says he is. That the Lord is Jehovah Ra uh, Jireh. Therefore, I would trust that he will provide. Not a matter whether he's providing or not. He is who he says he is. And I would trust that he will provide. He's Jehovah Rapha. Not whether I'm getting healed or not. This is who he says he is. And I would trust that he will heal. See, because when our expectations fall short, many times we want to know why. You never understand the why. Look for the what. What are you doing, God? Show me what you're doing and help me move towards that. I shared the story before about my dad taking his own life. And I asked those questions. I had just become a Christian. I'd gone through the mountaintop experience of giving my life to Jesus. My dad and myself, we weren't close at all. But we were just coming together again. He's, he's buying coffee for me from McDonald's. How much closer can you get as a dad? And our life was just coming back together again. And then he takes his own life. And in my car, driving to my mom's house, why? 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 But all I could sense the Lord was saying was it's not about why. What are you going to do with your life now? I was still a sitting judge then. I'm not saying that that was the, the watershed moment that changed my whole life, but those kind of things that helped me to understand the questions to ask. What are you going to do? God, what do you want me to do with my life now? Because you'll never understand the why. And rather than get frustrated, take on eyes to see. Matthew 13, you'll be forever hearing but never understanding. You'll be forever seeing but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears. They've closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn. And I will heal them. Blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. Lord, I do believe. Help my unbelief. The things that I'm not seeing, Lord, help my unbelief. The things that I don't understand, God, help my unbelief. God isn't looking for a perfect faith. He's looking for an authentic faith. An authentic faith is willing to say, Lord, I don't have it all together. And I want my marriage to come back. I want my son to come home again. I want this to happen, but I don't know and I don't understand. God, help me to understand. Show me what you're doing. Because when you follow the story of the, the man and Jesus, and the father said, Lord, I do believe, help my unbelief. Notice what Jesus didn't do. He didn't say, oh, okay, well, let's work on that then. See, next week there's a class on faith building. Why don't you take that? Or here's like three books you can read on building up your faith. No, he didn't do any of that. Once the man was willing to admit that he didn't have it all together, that was authentic faith. And it now gave Jesus room to do what he needed to do. Mark 9, verse 25. When Jesus saw the crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said. 
I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. As defiant as the spirit was, nobody can top Jesus. No match for Jesus. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. See, when we're willing to admit that our faith's not perfect, <coughs> it gives God room to do what only he can do. When we fake our faith, God can't touch that. When we say things like, and I hear this from guys a lot. Hey, how are you doing? Let me help you with that. No, no, I can't handle. I can't handle. Well, your marriage falling apart. Let me hear. No, 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 I can't handle. I can't handle. No, you cannot handle. Come on, be real. Be open. And say, I understand these things. I don't understand these things. I believe these things. Lord, help my unbelief. Then God has room to begin to do the work in him. Charles Spurgeon, in this case, the man's unbelief was not a rebellion against or a rejection of God's promise. He did not deny God's promise. He desired it. However, it just seemed too good to be true. Thus, he says, help my unbelief. It's something a man can only say by faith. While men have no faith, when, while men have no faith, they are unconscious of their belief. But as soon as they get a little faith, they then begin to be conscious of the greatness of their unbelief. See, faith isn't an absence of doubt. Faith is a willingness to trust him in spite of your doubt, in spite of your fears. What do you need a miracle in today? Where do you need God to begin to move in a miraculous way in your life today? When you go home tonight, I would encourage you, lay that before the Lord. Lord, I do believe that my marriage can get better. Help my unbelief. I don't know how. Lord, I believe you can heal me. Help my unbelief. I believe that my, my children will grow up into men and women of God, that they'll be following in your ways. Oh, such a rough world out there. Lord, help my unbelief. What is it that you need a miracle in? Be honest with God. Be authentic with God. And you give him room. And as has been said to me in many prophetic words, God says, watch and see what I will do. Watch and see what I will do. Not up to you. It's up to God. Amen? Let's all stand. I'll pray. And then we'll sing our last song. Father, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for the times that even though we tried to do it our own ways and we came against a wall, that you never stopped pursuing us. Help us, Lord, to be authentic with you. To admit in the areas that we are still struggling. Father, we give you room to make a difference. Wherever it is that we need a miracle, Lord, we believe in you. Help our unbelief. We trust in you. Help our unbelief. Lord, we don't want to live just good lives. We want to walk into the greatness of who you are. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church says, amen, amen.